Amen. Somebody just tell somebody I had to lose it. I, I had to lose it to gain it. Yeah, I know that's a I know that can be difficult. We don't like to give up too many things in our life, especially things that we hold on to and we find to be dear to us. Uh, many times uh, God will ask us to release some things. He'll ask us to give up some things in order for him to be able to be ready and in position to give us more. It's the losing of the things that gives God the opportunity to see just who God was in your life. Because sometimes we don't want to give up things because we've put a lot of ourselves into those things. And when we put ourselves into those things and become attached to those things, we hold on to those things. And when we lose those things, we feel like we're losing our mind. Has anybody ever lost their Everybody, and it's at the moment when you're trying to find yourself out the door headed to work and you can't find your keys and you're scrambling all over to find your keys and you're almost in a panic because you need these keys or you're going to be late to the job. So you have to find those keys, but you've lost those keys. You've misplaced those keys. And at that moment in your life, you realize when you find those keys, you feel like there's a great sense of relief. Your heartbeat goes back down. Your blood pressure drops back down and everything is right with the world because you once again, found something that was lost in your life. I'm going to give you just a backdrop of where we are on this morning as we look at Abram. We look at Abram's story and as we studied before last week and we looked at the story of Abram, we find out that God chose Abram. He hand selected Abram to do something that he wanted him to do. He knew that Abram would be this type of person that if I give Abram the opportunity to be trusted, Abram won't let me down. He won't let me down, but Abram will be somebody I can trust somebody who will walk in faith somebody who will not turn his back on the Lord somebody that when God tells him to go right he's going to go right somebody when God says go left he's going to go left as a matter of fact Abram now is, is fresh still in his faith and he's still walking with the Lord and you have to understand that when God gets ready to take us certain places God will give you certain faith tests to allow you to be strengthened and prepared to handle the level that you're going to let me break it down this way there is something that's so big with each person in this room assigned to your life. There is something greater than even the seat that you're sitting in right now. But God has to allow you to go through some faith tests in order to prepare you. Nobody gets to a college degree without going through elementary school, middle school, high school, and then college. You can't go to your sophomore year in college and get a bachelor's degree. No, you have to go through all four years. You have to go through some things that you have to deal with, some circumstances that you have to face in order to get to the place to where God can say you've made it here now I can bless you at the level I've brought you to and many people have not been blessed at a level because you're still holding on to your secondary education you're still holding on to where God delivered you from you're still holding on to people in your life that were holding you back and keeping you down from going to your next level in life God knew that I could trust Abram if I give Abram a little time he will learn who I am in the pardon of his own life he will learn exactly how good I am in my life and you know sometimes God has to allow each one of us to go through certain trials certain tribulations he has to allow you to get your feelings hurt he has to allow you to get frustrated and be let down in order for him to prepare you to handle the greatness with you because everything listen watch this let me say it new levels are always going to bring new devils and the way you deal with those new devils is based on how you train with your old devils if you were able to overcome those old devils in your life if you were able to overcome what they threw at you then God can trust you with what you have now so Abraham now has been trusted by God. He's told him over in Genesis 13, Abram, I'm going to make your name great. He says, listen, all of this land I'm going to give not just to your descendants, but I'm going to give them to your generations. He had to get rid of Lot first before God tells him, I'm going to give you this land. So you remember when we talked two weeks ago and God shows up and tells him now that Lot is out of your life, now that you all have separated because remember, Abram had a lot and Lot had a lot. And because they had a lot of substance, the people People that worked for Lot and the people that worked for Abraham were against one another and because they were against one another they begin to fight over things that both of them had the right to in their own right why do we argue amongst ourselves when God has given us the ability to own your own territory why be jealous of somebody else's car when God's giving you the same 40 hours in a week to go earn your own car why be jealous of what that man or sister is wearing when God has given you the physical capacity and the ability to go out and earn what 
you want to wear. Don't be hating all the time on what other folk have, but learn to learn how to appreciate what you have before you begin to lust for what other folks have. And this is a problem that we find not happening only in the world, but we find it also happening in the church. Okay, let me do it this way. This is what's happening now because God is preparing Abram now. He's preparing him for something much greater, but before he can give him much greater, he has to cause Lot to get out of his life. Lot has to leave now because this is the wrong connection for me to give you, Abram, what it is I have for you. And you can't get what God has for you in its full totality until you get rid of some things that are in your life that will prevent you from holding on to what it is that God has has for you in store for you. God has something mighty for you, but because you haven't learned how to let go of yesterday, because you haven't learned how to stop singing, boys, the men, it's so hard to say goodbye to yesterday. I know you love it. You made a song and a ballad about it, but God said, now that you sing about it, I need you to rejoice about what's coming on tomorrow. I rejoice long enough about 138 years. Lord, what do you have for 139 years? I don't know about you, but I'm ready to run on a little while longer. Is there anybody here that's made up in their mind? that I'm ready to run this race. I know it's going to be some hurdles. I know it's going to be some obstacles. I know it's going to be some pain. I know some folks might leave me, but I made up in my mind that, God, I'm going to run this race, and it's my race, and I don't care what the devil says about it. I don't care what mama says about it. I don't care what Ebenezer says about it. Your race is your race. God said this race is for you. Let you run this race with patience. So in the text, Abram tells, is told by God in chapter 13, that now that Lot is gone, I'm going to give you and your descendants the land. I couldn't give it to you yet because Lot was with you. And we talked about Lot being not a baby, but being a grown man because he had his own stuff. And we talked about how Abram was allowing young Lot or young male Lot to stay with him, even though he had his own stuff. Sooner or later, we got to stop letting our children put their name on the milk in our house. Just because I got a basement does not mean that's your room. Once you hit a certain age, young men, let me come to my men real quick. Because God says, when I was a child, I thought, acted, and spoke as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. There are some situations where, yes, our children have to stay with us as adults, but there comes a time now that we begin to spoil them a little too much. And they begin to want to argue with us now. After everything I did for you, you want to tell me how much gas to put in my car? And this is not so far from the church. We've got folk been coming to church for 40 years and still living on childlike mentalities. Because you've been in church 40 years, you graduated high school, Sunday school, there ought to be some evidence in your life for the younger generation to look up to. But listen, listen. Canaan was a great land, a blessed land. There was a lot of wickedness there. But God said, this territory, Abram, I'm going to give to you. Do you realize that Lot could have went anywhere else and stayed in a good place of Canaan? But this boy decides to go down to one of the most wicked areas in the land known as Sodom. And he says, it looks good over there because they got water flowing. The people look like they're happy even though they hate each other. But they're prospering because there's so many of them. And I just have to be in the crowd because I know I can benefit from being a part of that system. So Lot, in his lack of wisdom, journeys down to Sodom and he's resting amongst the wicked people. And this is where we get to our text because he's resting among the wicked people. And because he's resting among the wicked people, he's, re he's re resting right now among a people who are being seen as somebody to be attacked. Be careful about who you connect and align yourself to because your connections can be your defeat. Your connect, even though you may have good principles and good morals and a good outlook on life, you can find yourself around certain crowds. You can find yourself around certain people that can prevent you from all out being who God's called you to be. It can stop you or it can put you in the wrong place at the wrong time, which we're about to find out with what happens with Lot. Lot gets placed by the place of Sodom. 
And in the text, here's what happens. And I'm going to talk to you real quick because I want to deal with a couple theological terms. And I give these to you. If you want to write them down, please do. It'll be on the video. But I want you to understand a couple of theological terms on today. And we're going to deal with this because this is what is happening in Abraham and in Lot's life. We realize that Abraham, or Abram now at this point, is Lot's uncle and Lot is Abram's nephew. We realize he's not a child under 18, but he's a grown man who has his own substance. But the words I want to give you, there is something that God operates in. And it's two things. It's called God's sovereignty. Sovereignty and God's providence. God's sovereignty and God's providence. God's sovereignty and God's providence. God's sovereignty represents his absolute ability to be in, in control of everything he's created. In other words, he created heavens and the earth mankind. So just because God created it, he owes nobody any explanation on what he decides to allow to happen in your life. As a matter of fact, God is absolute when it comes to the totality of his sovereignty. His sovereignty means that because I created you I can control you but his providence is another way of looking at this because inside of his sovereignty because he creates me he also provides for me and nobody can provide for you like the one that created you okay let me come home see you thought mama and daddy created you you thought they created you in 74 or 62 though but it was God that before the foundations of the world knew you and placed you with the family that would help pray, prepare you and train you everybody in here has been born in the right place by the right family because God knew you needed that family connection to help develop you and give you what you need. Even though that parent may not have been in your life, that was the exact absence that you needed in your life that would give you the motivation and the determination to be all that God's called you to be. No, my daddy wasn't there for me. No, my mother wasn't there for me. But because they wasn't there, I will be the best mother. I will be the best father. I will not make the same mistakes they made. Or you didn't have the best brother in your life or the best sister in your life. But you learned that I'm going to be a good friend to whoever I meet, mean, I learn. I'm going to be a good sister even though we're not blood related. Some people are better sisters and brothers than their own kin. Some people treat people better than their own siblings. Some churches treat deacons and pastors better than their own church. I'm here to tell somebody right now, don't get so caught up. So his sovereignty is his absolute control. His providence is his grace and mercy that navigates you through that level of control. You got it? Sovereignty is his control. Providence is his provision, which means God controls my circumstances, but he also provides for me within those circumstances, which means that God can bring me to a valley, give me the circumstances to cross that valley. Because he creates everything. But inside this text, watch what happens. Watch what happens. Lot gets taken because it says that four kings get tired of dealing with five kings. You got to read verse four, chapter 14, verse 1 through 7, and you'll find out the backdrop of that. And what happens here is five kings now, who include Sodom and Gomorrah, where Lot was staying at, these five kings got tired in the 13th year. For 12 years, they had been listening to these four kings. For 12 years, they had been doing what these four, these four kings were more powerful. These four kings had more resources. But guess where they got the resources from? They had to cross by a lake or a valley that went over into the area of the five kings. So the five kings says, wait a minute, they're getting rich off of us. We're sick of it. A change has got to happen now. So it says in the 13th year, they rebel. And they go against the four kings. And in a nutshell, the four kings gave them all they wanted. And they had them running and chasing after each other, scared. And it said that many of the people, the kings fled from Sodom and Gomorrah, but many of the people fell in the pits. And many people died in that war. But it goes on to say that they not only took everything from the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah in their peers, but it said these other four kings also took Lot. And this is where I want to start the story at. Because Lot right now is now placed in a place in his life that has nothing to do, nothing to do, watch this, with Abram. Because Abram did not tell Lot where to reside. He told Lot to pick where he wanted to reside. And inside of these providence and sovereignty conversations, you have to understand how we got to sovereignty and how we got to God's providence. Can I tell you real quick, you got to go back to me to Genesis chapter 1, where God creates all things. But when God creates all things, that's a picture of his sovereignty. But what else, what else did he create? He goes over to chapter 3 and he creates a man named Adam. And he creates this man named Adam. Well, if he creates Adam, that's proof of his sovereignty. But when he blows breath into Adam and causes Adam to be a living being... 
he now has to introduce providence because my sovereignty creates him, but my providence takes care of him. So now I have to take care of Adam. Can I teach real quick? So now I have to take care of Adam because it's my providence now that assures and shows my sovereignty. If it's not for my providence, then my sovereignty wouldn't matter in the first place. See, God can create you, but if God doesn't give the provisions to take care of you, then all you are is a creative being with nothing in your life to look forward to. But because of God's providence, it now connects me to God's sovereignty. But there's something that happens real interesting here is that now inside sovereignty and in between sovereignty and providence, you have three te theological terms that I want to give you that God allows to happen in your life. You have three terms I want to give you. You have sovereignty and providence, but in between you got three things. You have God's directive will, you have God's permissive will, and you have God's overruling will. Can I give you the word this morning? You have God's directive will, which means God's directive will is putting you on the track that God has in store for you. That's his directive will. God wants for you, the best for you, and everything you need, he has for you. He is omniscient, which means he knows all. He is omnipresent, which means he's everywhere. He's omnipotent, which means he has power over all. So because God loves you so much, God wants to protect you, so God will give his directive will in giving direction over your life that points you in the right direction for your life. But then there's something called God's permissive will. Adam had God's directive will. Adam, don't eat that tree, man, because if you eat of that tree, you're going to surely die. That's his directive will. And it said that Adam kicked it in the garden, walking in the cool of the day with God, minding his own business, enjoying God's sovereignty by way of his providence and understanding that his directive will is what's going to carry me to the place God has for me. And then all of a sudden, God said, not Adam, God said it's not good for man to be alone. And then God now introduces Eve into the equation. Her name wasn't Eve yet, but she was just woman made to man Adam. And he brought Adam Eve, and he brought him over to her. And Adam said, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Lord, you show sure been good to me. I don't know if anybody's ever met somebody, and they started to take a liking to them, and they asked you out on a date, and you just stop and praise God. You show sure been good to me. I know my wife Jasmine probably did that when she met me. She said, Lord, you show sure been good to me, giving me free me. Oh, now let me, maybe it's the other way around, but at the end of the day, you know what I mean by that, right? God brought the woman to eat Adam, and Adam said, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, I have been called man. She came out of man. You should be called woe man, and now she's woe man. Now, watch what happens. The devil says, I got somebody here who did not get direction of the directive will and does not really truly understand God's providence nor his sovereignty, because everything she was to understand had to come from Adam, but Adam was so in love, I must assume this. This is not commentary. This is not anywhere. This is free monology, if you will. I'm assuming Adam did not take the time to educate Eve, a sister girl, the way God took the time to educate him. And I want to stop and tell you why I think that. Because we in the 21st century church, this neo-Pentecostal generational church that we have today, does not take the time to educate our younger people, to educate our members. We don't come to church school. We don't come to Bible study. But we want to pray and talk all kind of tongues. God said until you take the time to learn the word for yourself, you ain't got nothing to share. An empty glass can't pour into another empty glass. If you ain't got nothing on the inside of you to pass along to the next generation, then the next generation won't be able to have the sovereignty and the providence. You will be living by mercy and not God's grace. Oh, hallelujah. But the Bible says, the Bible lets me know even further here that now we go from directive will to now Eve listening to this devil now saying, eat of the fruit you won't surely doubt. Now enters permissive will. And permissive will is the will that God will allow you to do certain things as long as it does not impact or affect or stop his overall plan for your life. If God can see in your life that I'll permit you to do this because it's needed for your development in life, then I'll permit you to do this thing, even though God knows it's not good for you, even though God knows it won't help you, even though God knows it could kill you, God will let you do it because God's going to get a blessing on the other end of that thing. You meant it for evil, but God's going to turn it around for your good, and this is what permissive will is. He lets Eve now, watch this, he lets Eve eat of the fruit because he gives them the chance to go ahead and do because God is not going to force anybody to love him. God is not going to force you to serve him. God is not going to force you to 
tithe. God is not going to force you to give your offering. God ain't going to shut all the windows of heaven. As a matter of fact, God might bless you even though you ain't acting right. That's how good God is in our life. That's the type of God you serve. He's not a God that will hold a grudge against you. He's going to judge you, but he's not going to kill you until your time. So now it's permissive will. And in my permissive will, enters in now the covenant of works. And the covenant of works I talked about about a month, two months ago, the covenant of works was what God set up. As long as man did this, I'll do this. So God said, Adam, as long as you don't eat the tree, you won't die. But if you eat the tree, you're going to die. So now we're talking about permissive will. And permissive will, Eve ate the fruit. Men, don't get it twisted again. I'll give it to you. I don't want us ever to forget this. Sister girl eats the fruit. And it says after she eats it, she does what? Gives it to her husband, not down the street, not back over in the tree house, not over in the park with his boys, but it said he gave her the fruit who was beside her, which means the man was standing beside Eve. The whole time the devil was attacking Eve, and I here to let somebody know many of us sit back and watch our neighbor be attacked and be attacked spiritually, be attacked physically, and all we want to do is stand by and watch what happens so we can put it on Facebook or get a picture of it. We got kids in the streets fighting each other at gas stations, and all you want to do is hold your camera up to see how many views and likes you can get. I'm sick of this world acting as if God is not real. I'm sick of this world acting as if God won't get the glory. I'm sick of this world acting as if God's sovereignty and his providence are not still in control. We got to do better. And many times it's church folk doing it. Oh yeah, oh yeah. We're not talking all about the world because the world don't know no better. We're the ones that know God's word supposedly. But just because you sit in here don't mean you live in here. Because sitting inside of the building ain't like sitting inside the book. So when we look at this, permissive will has entered. We don't get to overruling will until we get to this text. We don't get to covenant of grace until we get to Abram. Covenant of works entered in after the sin. And then it continued up to Genesis chapter 12. And God said, I realize that there's nothing that man can do for themselves based out of their works. And I don't care how many sermons you preach, Freeman. If your heart ain't right with me, if you haven't been, listen, anybody can preach that knows how to orate. Anybody can preach that knows how to communicate. But do you know how to dissect the word and understand who the word is? For my Bible says, and the word was made flesh and it dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The only begotten of the father, full of grace and full of truth. We got too many motivational speakers. Hiding behind the pulpit desk. We got too many secondary third string rosters hanging on the deacon pews. And we got too many mannequins hanging in the sanctuary. And a mannequin ain't good for nothing but looking good. It ain't hearing or telling nothing. This commercialized Christianity has got to come to a stop. You can't handle covenant of works because you don't act right. So I got to enter covenant of grace. And covenant of grace is when I entered Abraham because I realized that my works and your works don't match up. Because we can't meet God's perfection. That's why he sent Jesus. But what he can do is we can meet his grace. Because grace has nothing to do with us. Grace has all to do with him. And when you enter in his grace, you have to enter in now his providence. Because his providence is saying, I will care for you even though you don't care for me. I got directive will, permissive will, but I'm trying to figure out that overruling will. The kings go back after the five kings. And they defeat them. And they carry away all that they had, including Lot. So over in chapter 13, Abram has to get rid of Lot just to come back to chapter 14 and have to go get Lot. Abram was minding his own business, living the good life, living off the blessings and the promises of God. He was in a good place in his life. I mean, he was in a resting place. And I'm not talking about mortuary rest. I'm talking about he was resting and he had no drama. 
He didn't hear no fighting in the fields from his field people and Lot's field people. He was at peace because God was blessing him and has restored not only his soul, but his relationship. Because after that experience in Egypt, Abram learned, I can't lie and think God don't know I'm lying. And I got to stop real quick and say, we can't keep doing wrong and think God don't know we doing wrong. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. God knows everything that we do before we do it. And that's why God's directive will transitions into permissive will because some of your foods is God lets you do. Because God needs to make an example either out of you or who's watching you. Permissive will. So Abram is sitting here relaxing, chilling, doing what he's normally doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And it says a man escapes from the war right there in the text. He escapes. But watch what happens. He escapes. God allowed a man to just never gave his name to escape a bloody battle not flee in another direction, but to know Abram so well enough to go run to Abram and say, listen, man, your nephew got kidnapped. This is what I love about God. God always has a ram in the bush. Just when things do not look like it's going to work out for your life, just when the devil thought he had his hooks in you and you were gone, just when your boss counted you out with your attendance record, just when the school said you weren't going to be readmitted because you had a bad semester the year before, God showed up and allowed you to write a letter so that that school can accept you back into good status. God showed up and moved you away from that boss and it made you their boss. God showed up and helped you overcome. Just when the devil thought he had you to feed it. That's when God gets the most glory out of your life. People may not realize it. People may not see it. People may not understand it, but just because they don't understand it doesn't mean God didn't have, make it happen. God can make whatever he needs to happen, happen in order to get you to the place he has for you. Amen. But look at what happens. Watch what happens. I got to get ready to close here. It says that when they get here, the man says they took Lot. Abram could have said, well, that's not my problem. He's a grown man. You want me to go after him? He's the one got me in all this in the first place. Because God tells him, don't bring your family. And he brings Lot anyway, a grown man. Listen, Ebenezer, please. When God tells you to do something. Okay. When God tells you to do something, first thing, you can't be afraid of nobody to do it. And two, 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 you got to trust that God has the answers in the end. When you have faith in God, I'm talking about real faith, you don't need Reverend Freeman to say, God told me you're going to do this. You don't need me to come prophesy, lay hands over you and say, you're going to be the next this. What I'll do for you, however, is I will say, God told me this about you, that you will be the head and not the tail, that you would be above and not beneath, that you will be the lender and not the borrower, that you would be this and you will be that. He said, if you will just trust in him and lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, that he will direct you. He told me to tell you to taste and see that he's good. He told me to tell you that you're more than a conqueror. He told me to tell you that you can do all things through Christ Jesus. When I talk like that, I'm not talking from Freeman. I'm talking from the inspired word of God that speaks over each one of our lives if you have a relationship by Christ Jesus. Yes, I could prophesy all, all day long with this word. But when I start saying God told me to tell you Kroger going to promote you, I might can see it or feel it. But all I'm going to tell you is if you just hang on a little while longer. If you just position yourself right, if you just come to work on time, then there's a possibility that Kroger may look at you and smile on you and God will connect the smiles and bless you. I was, I was at, at the hospital visiting with our members. Pray for Brother Huff and the family. Brother Huff, I was up there and I was cutting up with Sister Lane's father. I don't know if he said, he said, I walked in, I was telling, man, I, I said, Ben, I want to come in here and tell you a story. He said, I just got to come tell you. I got to come in here and I got to testify. And Brother Huff said, no, you getting ready to test the lie. Had us, had us dying in the hospital last night. And I, said, and I said, okay, okay, okay. When we look at this word, and we look at Lot, and we talk about Abram and Lot's relationship, 
Abram should have left Lot where he was. He should have left him in Haran. But he had to lose Lot at a period in his life in order for him to go gain something. The next week we're going to talk about what he really gains. But this week in going after him, the Bible says this is what he had. He did not say, let Lot take care of himself. But what he said is, I got to go get this boy. So it said he got together 318 people. This reminded me so much of Gideon. He was getting ready to go after four mighty kings and kingdoms with 318 people. He said, get my 318, which lets me know that Abraham was not just a shepherd or a wanderer, but Abram went from being a wanderer to a general because he pulled together 318 people and he devised a strategy because he realized that he was laying in between God's sovereignty and in between God's providence. And because God brought me through that situation and because God brought me up out of Egypt and because God saved me in a famine, because God brought me back to the place called Bethel, which is the house of God. Notice that it said these kings in Sodom were on the east, the east of Abram. And we talked about the east was a place called Ai. And the place called Ai, A-I means the ruin, which means that anybody that was east of Bethel was standing in a place called ruin, which means that Lot had suggestedly placed himself in a place or himself in a place called ruin. And when you place yourself in ruin, you're stepping outside of the house of God. And when you step outside of the house of God, you give yourself the propensity to be affected by everything that goes on outside of the house of God. But can I preach real quick for a few minutes and let somebody know that you can be sitting in a church building and still be on the outside of the house of God? The reason many folk think that they serve in God is because you come to church every Sunday. That's not it. Because you gave your tithe. That's not it. Because you gave your offering. That's not it. But you can be literally sitting in a church building and be so far away from God. And God is saying this has to be the generation where the members in every church who are sitting inside of the church are ready to make up their mind that for Christ I'm going to live and for Christ I must die. God, you called me to an assignment. I may not know it right now, may not have the back and I need right now, but God, you placed me here and because of your sovereignty and because of your providence and because of your directive will operating and my perverse will to accept it, if you will accept God's promise over your life, God can restore you and give you what you need. It says he took 318 men and 318 men pursued them. Abram did not say, how many do they got over again? What's the odds look like? He said, I got 318 men. And here's what we're going to do, Jeff and Jesse. I want you three, you sit over there, and I want you all over here. And we're not going to go at daytime, but we're going to go. At, this right here is the first recorded war in the Bible. And the only reason we hear about it is because of God's sovereignty. The only reason we hear about a war between these nations, the four kings and the five kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, the only reason we hear about it is because it concerns Abram. If Abram had never been mentioned, if Lot had never been in here, we would have not probably heard about a war until David. But this is the first recorded war in the Bible in Genesis 14. And because it's so important, because it's so important, God has to put his plan in place. It says, no, Abram, when you divide them, I want you to go at night and not the daytime. Why at night? You know, at night, a lot of things happen at night. And at night, a lot of things happen at night. We really tend to go straight to the bad things. But I was growing up as a child. One of the things I knew at night that would always happen, and it always happened right before I went to bed, it was always a thing that was training me to do every night before I went to bed. And it was always in the night season that I would do this. And I would get down in front of my bed. And I would get down on my knees. And mama taught me and grandmama taught me. They taught me to get down on my knees. And they taught me to get in front of that bed in the night season. And you know in the night season, that's not always, they say the night time is the right time to be with the one you love. And that's the truth in so many words. Because the night time really is a good time to be with the Lord. Because during the daytime, you find yourself being torn between two situations. You find yourself working on the job. In the daytime, you're all over the place. But at nighttime, there ought to be some peace in your life to where you can go in your prayer closet at night. You can go to your room at night. And you can get inside that place at night and you can get down on your knees and begin to call on the name that's above every other name and can begin to declare, Lord, you brought me from sunrise 
the sun set. Lord, you brought me from daytime to nighttime. Lord, you allowed me to drive to work and I had a three quarters of a tank of gas. Didn't know how I was going to make it 20 miles, but you allowed me not only to get to the job with 20 miles, but you allowed me to get all the way back home until payday. And somebody said, I'm glad I never would have made it if it had not been for the Lord, but you restored my tank. You blessed me with enough energy. So now that I've retired, I done had dinner. I done watched all my eight and nine o'clock shows. Now it's time for me to go to my prayer room, get down on my knees, and begin to devise a strategy. And Lord, I'm not just praying for you, telling you what I want you to give me. I'm not just praying, asking you to give my kids this. I'm not just praying, asking you to restore my family, but I'm praying, Lord, that you can do for me like you did for me all day today. If you allow me to raise clothing in my right mind, because at nighttime, when we lay down and go to sleep, if you work a regular job, not third shift, but at nighttime, that's the night when you begin to go to sleep. And when you go to sleep, you have something called dreams. And in your dreams at night, God begins to reveal himself to you. Because as long as you're in an unconscious state, you can begin to receive God's conscious state. And when God speaks to your mind in your nighttime season, when you're laying and you're in your first watch of the night, and you're in your second watch of the night, and you're in your third watch of the night, round about five or six in the morning, you begin to wake up all eyes open, and you look all around the room, saying, what did I just dream about? That was God speaking to you there, telling you that you ain't been acting right, that you gotta get your house in order, or he might be speaking to you, saying, this is the job I want you to do. This is the place I want you to go. You gotta learn how to treat people better. But it said at nighttime, y'all, that Abram began to devise a strategy, and he said, Jeff, y'all go that way, and Jesse, y'all go that way. Why? Because in the night season, that's when you can confuse the devil, because the devil don't understand what God don't allow him to understand. The devil can't do to you what God won't allow him to do to you. Oh, you don't believe that? Let me go to Job chapter 1. For the Bible says that God had Job's back, and it was the devil that went up to the heaven, and he said, listen, have you considered my servant Job? He said, I've considered him, but you've had a hedge around him. He said, if you move that hedge from around him, then allow me to attack him. You'll see how much he's going to serve you, and that's for somebody in the house, because you've been being attacked here lately. You've been going through some pain lately. You've been going through a struggle lately, but God told me to show up and tell you like he told Job. You can touch everything he got, but you better not kill him. Some of us are holding on like this. Some of us are walking like this, because God is holding your right leg together because he won't let the devil kill your right leg. He won't let the devil take the bounce out of your step. He won't let the devil take your mind. Yes, I'm half crazy at times. Yes, I don't think straight all the time, but God won't let devil take my whole mind because there's some strategy in my life that needs to be worked out. Somebody in here is working on a strategy right now. Somebody in here is working on God's plan right now, and God told me to show up and tell you that what's been made for you is for you, and here's what God's last thing is. He says, I'm taking you down between sovereignty and I'm taking you between providence. I'm giving you my directive will. I'm giving you my permissive will. But it says at the end of the day, poor Lot was taken off with the people and Abram goes out and saves his nephew. The text tells us that he leaves now and he wins the war. He brings back all the people, brings back all of the goods. But it says one thing at the end and he brought back his nephew Lot. He had to lose Lot in order to gain a lot. And in other words, sometimes you got to let some folks go in order for them to come back better. You got to let some people ride in order for them to come back with the right mind. COVID had to move some people out of the way in order for us to go to the next. And you don't believe what I'm talking You got to lose a lot in order to gain a lot every now and again. And now we see God saying, Lot, you've been messed up for a long time. You still worship idol gods. You're living in a land of wickedness. But because I love Abel and because you're connected to Abel, I'm not going to conclude you in my directive will. I'm not going to include you in my permissive will, but I'm going to conclude you in the overruling will, which means what should have killed you only made you stronger. What should have stopped you only strengthened you. What should have prevented you only pushed you and brought you back to the place that God has for you. I'm not operating. We all operate from one of those wheels. The directive will is certain. Because from the time you're born, God has directed your life. He knows before we know what tomorrow's going to look like. The permissive will, every one of us knew the will that we need to be in church. But some of us chose not to come. That's your permissive will. God said, okay, I'm going to let them do it. Just don't worry about them. Let them hang out there. 
Let me out there. And then something happens. Because permissive will is all it is, is you're rolling the dice with God. God is letting, he's allowing you to be you. You want to be big and bad and do what you're big and bad enough to do, go do it. Overruling will, however, and I love this one. Only, oh, in a sense, three words that describe overruling will and I'm done. Three words. God blocked it. What should have stopped you? God used it to build you up. What should have hurt you or harmed you? God used it to carry you further. What you thought wasn't good for you was necessary for you so you can have everything you needed. So I'm operating in this text between God's sovereignty and his providence. His sovereignty is his complete authority over all his creation. His providence is his, his, his purpose, his plan, his provision within his sovereignty. But as I operate between these two magnificent theological terms, there's a ministry that lies in between it, which God is ordering my steps through his directive will. He's allowing me to order my own steps through my permissive will. And then he's shutting stuff down saying, okay, you've gone far enough, Del Come on, man. But Barry, you've done too much. That road you can take, but this road, I can't let you die yet. And some roads we've traveled, God, I look back over my life, Ebenezer, and I begin to think about some of the roads that God allowed me to go in my own permissive will and how I look back now and say, if I had stayed on that path, then what I was on could have stopped me. It could have shut me down. It could have killed me. Is there anybody here as I get ready to leave that can testify that if it had not been for the Lord that was on my side, devil, you meant it for evil, but God turned that thing around for my good. I'm standing on his promises. I'm standing on his faith. And I just got about two minutes to tell you right now that what God has done for me, I'm a believer that God has done for you. You ain't got to raise your hand or shout or tell nobody your story. You just being here alive is a story in itself. Because some of us survived if everybody didn't have the same issue. We all had the same COVID. And we all went through the same season. And God brought us through two years of a pandemic and we're still I'm still stepping because the Lord overruled what I decided to go into some of y'all some of your minds are in the right place because God blocked you from being with that man and vice versa some of us men are in a good place because God says she's not for you but Lord, I won't. I got to have her. She's not for you. But Lord, I'm, I'm okay. I'm going to do me. I, I'll figure this thing out. Blocks it. Because if you don't shut it, let me say this. If you don't shut it down, you don't want him to shut it down. I got to say that again. If you don't shut whatever it is you're doing down that's opposite of this. And I got to experience. If you don't shut this down. He will shut it down. And when God shuts it down, you don't know what level he'll shut it down at. And I don't want to see us lose loved ones. And I don't want to see us have to go visit people in the hospital or something tragic to happen because you failed to listen to God tugging at your heart to do what needed to be done. Ebenezer, may God bless you. May God keep you. You will see next week Oh my God, I, I wanted to give it all to you today, but I can't give you Melchizedek. I can't take you to Melchizedek, and I can't tell you, can't take you to the king of Sodom. Because I, I love how Abram deals with the king of Sodom. And I love how he introduces Melchizedek. Melchizedek is like a Christ in the Old Testament. Some would say, once again, a theophonic manifestation. We'll talk a little bit about that more, which is an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. Uh, we'll deal with that. But in this text next week, you will see what I mean by it when I say he had to lose a lot, a lot, a lot, to gain a lot. But even through rescuing Lot, Lot just can't get out of his permissive will of thinking. And we'll see how Lot's story ends up here in a couple of weeks. Many of you all know the story of Lot and his issue, but it starts here. I want you to see how it all builds up before we get to Sodom and Gomorrah because Lot, Lot's been cutting the food for a little while. And now his permissive will is gonna bring him to a dead end 
and it can make you lose people and things around you that you really love. As we prepare to go into 139, this new year of Ebenezer Ministry history, let this be a year that we recognize God's directive will for our life, his permissive will, but also his overruling will. But the most important thing that you can control is that permissive will, because the permissive will gives you the ability to control your own actions. So in our thinking and our living, let it be with this knowledge. Study to show thyself approved. May God bless you and may God keep you. Brother, you. <laughs>